welcome everybody back into nerd sesh as always i'm carson brevard alongside me is logan camden and today we are going to be talking about what you guys have asked us to we're doing a mailbag episode today and i'm pretty pumped you guys threw a lot of good questions our way however the one surprise of the day logan not a single march madness question how mm. about that it's honestly kind of surprising yeah, unfortunately, it has led me to lose my home considering that I had there will be a March Madness question at minus 250, and I put all my life mm. savings on it. Mm. So we'll see how that affects the show going forwards, guys. I will be out on the street, but you know who won't? Logan is Nikola Jokic because he's doing pretty well for himself. And Richard Morgan asks, if Jokic performs at a similar level to what he did last year and the Nuggets come out on top, how much higher do you view him all time? You've often talked about how he's having the highest offensive peak ever, but does he eclipse the likes of, say, Steph or Kobe? That's a great question. And I think it it comes down to how you view longevity in your view of an all-time player. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, I think it would, because I value peak more than anything else. And uh I don't know. I view Jokic in a very rare tier of athletes where we were on Jason's show, which ironically will air after this airs, but yes. uh, we were talking about the inevitability of the Nuggets. And I don't know about you, Carson. I mean, Jokic to me has this feel of such control and dominance over the game. It's a Patrick Mahomes level feel where mm -hmm. I would be surprised if the Nuggets don't end up winning the title this season. And I would be surprised if Jokic doesn't ascend the mountain one more time. Uh, the Nuggets are such a great team conglomerate and then Jokic is so dominant on his own I'd be surprised if it didn't happen this year and if he does get it done then I'd be okay with that you just look at the overall impact that Jokic can have on team offense and the team aspect of it in general right Steph has a a special weapon in his own right the fact that he's has so much gravity off-ball gravity and he's the greatest shooter of all time and Kobe is one of the most skilled basketball players in NBA history and one of the greatest pure bucket getters but Jokic's effectiveness and efficiency is just on a different planet than those guys. The way that he can get to these unstoppable looks, the way that he is in a, in a completely different tier than those guys as a playmaker and elevating his teammates, and the fact that he's more impactful defensively and on the glass. Like, I just think Jokic's impact surpasses both of those guys, and you can make that argument pretty concretely if he does it again. Um, again, I think longevity is kind of the determining factor on, you know, does Jokic need to do it more? Does he need to sustain this level? But if he climbs the mountain again, I'm, I think I would put him over the likes of, of Steph or, or Kobe. I would put him in those top 10 kind of conversations all time. Interesting. So I have the top 25 all time that we did from this past off season. And when we did that list coming off of last year's finals run, I had Jokic at number 16. If he replicates last year's success, without a question, he is surpassing number 15, who was Kevin Garnett, number 14, who was Jerry West, number 13, who was Kevin Durant. Frankly, he's going to inevitably pass those guys. Like, he has just achieved a peak, in my opinion, that so far exceeds any of theirs. All due respect, I think that KG, KD, Jerry West, all those guys had very high peaks, but the sort of inevitable dominance that we are seeing from Jokic right now as this all-time singular offensive force it does lead to a consistent dominance individually and from the team that is very rare historically and I already feel that this peak that we're seeing from him right now is better than the peak that we saw from Steph and is better than the peak that we saw from Kobe Bryant we had this conversation with Hoop Venue it was a whole lot of fun a few weeks back and I think that Steph and Jokic are both tier one offensive players specifically of all time. Both of them are lacking in terms of defensive impact compared to most of the other all-time great players, but I prefer Jokic's offensive peak because of the physical imposition, his dominance there, how he gets wherever he wants on the floor, and then he is both the best touch shot maker and passer that we've seen, so he's just going to create good shots no matter what in any situation, no matter how physical, no matter how much time is on the clock, and I think that Steph's ceiling that he unlocks for an offense with his gravity his off ball value is so so high but at the end of the day he is subject to a little bit of variance and isn't able to get whatever he wants at will in the same way Jokic is directly and the floor that Jokic has the consistency because of that game to game series to series matchup to matchup he's just inevitable so I do slightly prefer that and then versus Kobe 
I think that Jokic pretty clearly has a higher offensive peak. There's a massive efficiency gap, and there's a very big playmaking gap, too. Even though I think Kobe did a bunch to stress defenses just with his variety as a shot maker. He demanded tons of defensive attention. Jokic has solved offense, though, in a way that Kobe just hadn't. So I think his peak is already higher. Offensively and overall, I don't think Kobe's two-way impact is enough to offset Jokic. We've talked about it before. I think he's overrated by accolades there. I think that his defensive impact waxed and waned and he wasn't the most impactful team defender but when it comes to these all-time rankings I would probably still lean both Steph and Kobe above Jokic actually I think I would have Jokic in that 13 spot and we do sort of get to a weird place where it's like I value peak over longevity and so if I just feel flat out Jokic has done something in this two-year stretch that is more impressive than anything that Steph and Kobe did. I think he has reached a higher level as a basketball player. It does start to get weird where I'm like, I don't have Jokic higher all time. But I still think there is a breadth of basketball accomplishment and uh, these incredibly high peaks paired with the longevity replicating those results that Kobe and Steph have that absolutely matters when we're ranking people all time. For Jokic, this would be his second deep deep playoff run when we're talking about finals title and uh, although i think for the last couple years before that it was mostly due to circumstances out of his control that he didn't get there like i think he certainly made a strong case for best player in the world both of his mvp seasons but he didn't have healthy jamal murray he didn't have mpj all of those things are out of his control but nevertheless Steph Curry, you're talking about six straight years where you were looking at finals runs and he's propelling you there. Kobe, obviously, you have a decade apart these stretches of multiple consecutive finals appearances. So I would probably have Jokic at 13. But last year, I thought he had one of the 10 greatest individual playoff runs we've ever seen. And if he's got two of those top 10 spots, that is very, very compelling. But at the end of the day, he is still just 28 and uh, it's really tough to be a top 10 player of all time when you just don't have the same length of career you don't have comparable longevity longevity isn't the most important thing to me like I talk about preferring MJ over LeBron because of the absolute peak but MJ sustained that over six deep playoff runs MJ sustained that over 11 seasons in Chicago at this superhuman level that's just more than what Jokic has done at this time and so longevity is more of a difference maker for him right now yeah but I mean I think it's inevitable that he's going to surpass and going to get there uh, unless he retires to go race horses then i don't you know, know what you do i wouldn't put it past him man you know yeah. um how high do you think he can climb well we had this conversation recently i think if he sustains this level for another half decade and if he decides i actually do want to play basketball into my mid-30s first of all i do think his game will age very well because mm -hmm. it is so overwhelmingly skill-based and strength-based and strength doesn't deteriorate explosiveness does so i think he can climb into the top five all time i think he has the potential to be the best offensive player ever i already think that his peak he probably is but i'm talking about in terms of mm -hmm. the overall career like if he just keeps doing this man he's going to propel all-time offenses and all-time teams and he's in a very good situation in terms of maintaining this team dominance because i think the supporting cast is so complimentary so he can do that i don't think that he can rival mj and lebron because of the gap in two-way value but pretty much everybody else i think is on the table if he decides that he wants to chase that okay we got another interesting question here from Ben, which I really like. Which past NBA players before 2000 do you think would excel in today's game, one from each position? The first guy that came to mind when I think of any point guard, and I know this is pre-2000, but it's two guys. Uh, the first is Rod Strickland. I think with how crafty mm. he was and how nasty he was as a ball handler, I think if you give him today's pace and space, the open environment. Same goes for Allen Iverson. Like, Allen Iverson's obviously on a different tier, but I think if you give him a spread out offense in today's NBA, that those two guys would thrive with a lot more space to operate. The two guard, I know you're quite fond of him. I think Reggie Miller would be a yeah. monster in today's game with how prevalent the three-pointer is, everything he could do off-ball, relocating, uh, stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to think about underrated guys, too, because... The first guy that I think about it like small forward is like Larry Bird, but it's like, mm. I mean, Larry would thrive in any, you yeah. know, any role ever. 
I have a full team if you want me to buy you a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll think on my I front think about court. this a lot. So I've done my ahead of their time all 2000s team, and there's a lot of good candidates from that range. Andre Kirilenko is an obvious one with his positional versatility, his playmaking as a forward. Rashid Wallace mm -hmm. facing the floor, good defensive big. Pejo Stojakovic, big shooting wing. Gilbert Arenas with his volume of three-point attempts and free-throw attempts. Kevin Martin. There's lots of good guys from the 2000s. But if we're going before then, I mostly focused on the 90s. At point guard, I have Tim Hardaway. I think, first of all, his ball handling was very much just unbelievable in his time. I mean, a lot of people consider him like the father of the crossover, certainly with that sort of speed and dynamism. Really good playmaker. But it is the pace with which he played especially in those run tmc warriors years and then the volume three-point shooting i think would translate very well to today's nba and i think that we see smaller guards thriving more today than ever before so i think that he would benefit from that at the two i have reggie it's just a no-brainer the volume shooting uh, the appreciation that just the NBA community has now for the off-ball value of a player like Reggie. I think he would rack up more accolades in this era for that reason alone. His efficiency also would be more appreciated. Just super ahead of his time offensively. You mentioned Larry, of course, the playmaking, the shooting at that size. Even though there are some aspects of his game that are throwback in their nature, there also are aspects that feel ahead of their time. And some things just translate, right? Physicality translates. Feel, basketball IQ translates. And Larry had all of that. I'll go with uh, sort of a Larry Light, Detlef Schrempf. I think that Detlef Schrempf, okay, just when you're okay. thinking again about 6'10 playmaking forward who could shoot, that is a more common archetype in today's NBA. It's something that I think we just have a better understanding of how to tap into with modern spacing and the overall skill development of some of those bigger guys. Power forward. One of my favorite players of the 1990s, I have Ant Mason. I think very much forecasted what we would come to expect from some undersized bigs of the last decade. And he wasn't like Draymond undersized. He's 6'8", but very stout, strong, 250, elite positional rebounder. So you weren't losing value on the glass, even if he was your four or five in some situations. Very good ball handler for that size. Fluid ball handler. Fluid mover overall, really good playmaker, very solid mid-range shooter uh, in the mid-40s from 10 to 16 feet in his career from when we have the tracking data and on a small sample size, over 50% from 16 feet to the three-point mm. line, and he could defend multiple positions. So I just think if you're looking at modern small ball lineups, he would be an ideal guy to have in those situations. And then at center, I went with Jack Sigma. I thought about going with a Sabonis or a Divots here, playmaking bigs who uh, were starting to stretch the floor, were taking a couple threes a game, but I ended up going with Sigma just because he was doing it before those guys, and there have been great passing bigs back to the 60s and the 70s. You have Russell and Wilt and Sam Lacey and Alvin Adams and Bill Walton, of course, all these guys, but you combine it with actually taking a couple threes a game and making them. Sigma was kind of the first guy to do that in the late 80s. I also thought about like some just conventional stretch bigs like Sam Perkins. Mm -hmm. But I think Sigma was ahead of his time in multiple ways in terms of how uh, modern bigs are utilized as like playmaking hubs and then also with the shooting. Whereas Sam Perkins is kind of just like, hey, this guy's big and he can shoot. Isn't that crazy? I'm going to take a couple of Sacramento Kings, I think. And I know they said pre-2000. Pre-2000, buddy. You're not taking C-Web. I can't take C-Web. I can't take He's Brad. not pre-2000. I mean, he starts pre-2000, but his most iconic years are early 2000s with the Kings. I can't take Brad Miller, man. That's messed up. You were going to take Brad Miller? Dude, Brad Miller had the schlick on him, man. That's what they don't get. Memento Core better. Memento Core. There's a guy we should shout out as ahead of his yeah, time. Yeah, actually. Andre Kirilenko is not a bad pick either. He's probably the poster boy. I mean, he'd be a monster. He is the in, poster uh, boy. Oh, my God. Today's league. Dude, that one stat that we did with Wemby still blows my mind. It's one of my favorite ever. The fact that there's only three guys to average 4.8 stocks per game, steals plus blocks per game since 2000, and it's Wemby, Ben Wallace, and Andre Kirilenko of all people. Dude, Absurd. it's not even surprising. I mean, he's one of the great defensive playmakers ever. Just an absolute menace, bro. I tweeted out a stat recently. The Jazz's record during his three-year peak when he played versus when he didn't, 
They were an over 500 team when he played, and I want to say they were like 14 and 48 with something when he didn't. Like his value, his on-off numbers from those years. He was just doing everything at mm -hmm. such a high level. I love AK-47. Such a monster, man. But not pre-2000s. Yeah. I was thinking about Chris Mullen, Is there anyone Mullen else you want to too? shout out? I think Chris Mullen would, uh, a good would have one. a great game uh, in today's... I mean, just shoot from everywhere on the floor. Well-rounded. It's interesting, though, man. Cause could I'm play to make of, two? I'm trying to think about other big men that we could go with. And that's the real crazy thing about... Big men are just so much more skilled now, man. Like, it's legitimately ridiculous. Like, I'm trying to think about any guy that's not just a straight-up rim protector or play finisher and that archetype's just super rare you know i mean if you want to shout out bill walton if you want to shout out alvin yep. adams any of those guys who were you know skilled passing big men too could shoot a little bit um that archetype's super rare that's why i mentioned c web because i mean how you think about just well-rounded guys there's not a lot of archetypes like that man no i love c web i'm a big c web guy i think the fact that they kept him out of the hall for as long as they did with how lenient the NBA normally is or the basketball hall of fame. Stupid man. I love C web. I love passing bigs in general and he is one of the best. Okay. Daniel Olson asks, what is Anthony Edwards ceiling as a player? And realistically are the wolves better off if they just stay in the three seed position in the West. When you look at playoff matchups. No, I don't. If the Timberwolves can somehow, I think they need to climb to two. I just don't want to take on Dallas in the first round. I think that's a tough matchup for anybody. Now, I want to say this, too. I thought Minnesota's boat was sunk the second that Carl Anthony Towns got hurt. I don't know, man. Anthony Edwards, the fight that this team has in them, the they just got a lot of dog, man. The, the Timberwolves yeah. play super hard, and so... I think a first-round matchup against anybody playing Minnesota is going to be a tough out. Like, Minnesota is going to grind them out, man. Um, and Anthony Edwards could go superhuman. So I think Minnesota has a real fighting chance against anybody that they run into out west. But I wouldn't want to run into Dallas. I would much rather match up against Phoenix. I think Minnesota... Uh, it's going to be a real interesting battle. I mean, it is pure offense versus pure defense. And I think that's going to be a... A fun battle to watch. I would much rather Minnesota climb to the two seed. I wouldn't want to take on Dallas in the first round. But Ant ceiling is a player. I think Ant could be the best player in the world one day. Now, that being said, if Victor Wembanyama ascends as fast as I think that yeah. Wemby is going to ascend, Anthony Edwards may never hold that throne. But I think he could be the best American player in all of basketball, for sure. Oh, yeah. And face of the league-wise, personality-wise... Ant, Ant checks all the boxes. The one thing that's just so remarkable, I was talking about friend uh, about this with friend of the show, uh, Michael Donahue, a few days ago, resident Timberwolves fan. Mm. Ant might have the craziest balance of any NBA player I've ever watched. We were talking about his dunks and his block mm -hmm. uh, in the Pacers game. Every one of those highlights, Carson, Anthony Edwards is still going up. Every one of those highlights. Like, he hasn't even reached his peak. Like, the, yeah. the only thing that stopped him on that Pacers block was him slamming his head into the stanchion. Yeah. You know, on John Collins, he is still elevating as he is dunking that ball. Like, uh, I think Anthony Edwards could be one of the handful of best basketball players on the planet. The oh, rim pressuring sure. ability, I think the mid-range pull-up game is going to reach uh, a level where it warrants him taking and, you know, taking a high volume of those shots. I think that's going to translate to three He's just the total package. I think when he finally becomes the, you know, top-notch rim pressure, I mean, he's already great, but once he becomes, you know, apex Anthony Edwards level, I think it's going to maximize his playmaking. The ceiling is unlimited, it feels like, for Anthony Edwards. I think best American player is expected. I think best player in the world is definitely still a potential, though. I expect him to be the best American basketball player. I expect him to win an MVP. I think he very well could win a scoring title. Luka Doncic is going to make that really hard to mm -hmm. do for the foreseeable future, as will an SGA. But I think there's probably one year where Ant is comfortably over 30, and I think he's going to hit 30 a couple times with just the monstrous production we're seeing across the league right now. And uh, if it weren't for Wemby, I would say that I can see him being the best player in the world someday. But when we're talking about his ceiling... He should be a top three player at some point. There is just such a rare combination of downhill force and finishing ability. I've mentioned this before, but 
NBA University would tweet out these graphics that basically talks about like shot quality and then finishing ability. And Ant would consistently be an F in rim shot quality and an A plus in rim finishing. Like it just doesn't matter who's in front of him. He is so strong. He's so bouncy. He's so agile. He's going to find a way to finish around the rim. And then he has improved as a pull-up shooter. He's just not nearly good enough there yet to be the consistent superstar that some people want to make him out to be because of, I think, what they see in his future, because of, I think, the Timberwolves team success, which is awesome, but a lot of that is about a great team defense. And uh, at the end of the day, right now, there are 39 guys taking six or more pull-up jumpers per game. Ant is in the bottom five in effective field goal percentage. It's not so much about the threes. He shoots fine on pull-up threes. It's more about when he does go to that mid-range game, he just is still lacking there and really struggles with efficiency. So maybe that develops more down the line. That's been a consistent issue for Ant since he was a prospect, the mid-range game and the floater touch, that overall intermediate game. But what he can do as a rim pressure and a flamethrower with these pull-up threes alone is so deadly. And it sets him up for these monstrous stretches, like what we've seen both times he's been in the playoffs. You mentioned these last four games without Carl Anthony Towns. He's over 32, 8, and 6 on really good efficiency with some super impressive defensive moments. And that's the other thing. If Ant fully dials in defensively, if he decides at some point in his career, I want to make all defense, I think that he's capable of it. I think he has such a strong base. He's such a good lateral mover. He can really disrupt people with his bounce as a shot blocking guard. He just has all the tools. He has all the tools to be a dominant force in this league, except for maybe that high-end playmaking and intermediate shot making. But he's improved as a playmaker, and I think he's a guy who will average probably close to seven assists a game in his prime just because of what you mentioned, the rim pressure element. And once he can consistently make the right reads there, it doesn't have to be super high-level stuff, just the basic stuff, he'll be a very impactful playmaker. So I love Ant, and I think that people want to elevate him to being the face of the league right now and uh, to being a clear top 10 player. And I just don't think he's there yet, but he's 22 years old. He is ahead of schedule and he is one of the most special players in the league today. And he's just got stupid supreme confidence, man. It's awesome. Oh, like, sure does. Thinks he's the best athlete in the world at every sport. In the in the one interview, somebody asked him, they were like, do you think prime Michael Jordan could guard you? And then the camera yeah. pans over to him. Hell no. Mm -hmm. I, Anthony Edwards is is awesome, man. Dude, I, did I, you see his reaction after? <laughs> he oh. dunked on John Collins. <laughs> did you see him with the TV guy, the broadcaster? Little ass, yeah, little ass yeah. boy. Little yeah. ass boy. Yeah, the TV broadcaster just sitting there smiling, like Dude. putting the mic up to Ant. That was funny. I love that. Well, that's my thing, man. Do you want Ant to not be himself? Ant is the most himself guy in the league. It's he just, is. there's no act there's no he's just him and yeah. I, I that's what i love ant for man there's no filter i love Ant. i love everything about ant i love that's his birthday really man i love say. his birthday man logan and ant are the exact same age we don't know down to the minute but down to the day and the year true story so man. they will forever be tied because of that okay s burgess asks out of the current nba western conference play-in teams who do you see making the furthest playoff run yeah, so the current uh, play-in teams are the Phoenix Suns, the Sacramento Kings, the LA Lakers, and the Golden State Warriors. I'd love to come on here and tell you that my Sacramento Kings are going to go do some damage this year in the playoffs. Uh, I don't anticipate it. If I had to pick a team, I would pick the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, I picked the LA Lakers to win the title preseason. Uh, I anticipated a lot of moves at the deadline. That didn't really happen, but some things have gone well. D'Angelo Russell's been playing his tail off, been shooting the hell out of the pill, been playing a lot better. Austin Reeves has been doing his thing, and ultimately the Lakers have two stars that I can bank on. And the biggest thing about them is, you know, it's their biggest advantage, and sometimes it's their biggest disadvantage. The fact that Anthony Davis or that Anthony Davis can disappear for a game with his shooting, or the fact that LeBron can take a night off. That's their greatest weapon, though, the fact that they have two of those guys that can just walk into 25 uh, certain nights. But I also think the Lakers are really well-equipped to withstand off nights from both of those guys. When you have two shot makers, the quality of Reeves and D'Angelo Russell, those both are subject to a lot of criticism. Uh, you know, you're in the limelight, you're under a microscope there in L.A., but 
they're both really solid, and they are both imperative to this team making a deep run. And along with that, along with having guys that can help float the ship when AD or LeBron are not wanting to take over or stuff like that, they're just really big. They got great size, and I've mentioned this in the past, but last year, Carson, when the Lakers didn't want to compete in a the game, they'd just say, all right, man, we'll, we'll mm-hmm. just go out and win tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And when the Lakers are locked in and engaged, and I hate always putting that caveat with the Lakers, when the Lakers are locked in and engaged, they are a good basketball team. It is just yeah. about getting there. Um, unfortunately, that's what I'm banking on. But that's why I think the Lakers are most well-equipped to do it. The Suns, to me, make too many mistakes offensively, uh, turnovers-wise, and they are not a good defense. I know the ceiling that they have with three stars like Beal, Booker, and Durant. Uh, They commit too many turnovers. Their defense is too porous. So for them, I don't anticipate a deep run. Golden State has one supreme offensive creator, Stephen Curry. I don't trust the guys around him to make things happen. And then Sacramento, two really dynamic scoring guards in De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk. And they've got shooting on the wings, and they've got a dynamic offense. But I think the limiting factor is, once again, DeMontis Sabonis and what he does uh, to not stretch the floor, um, to get kind of – beaten by other teams uh, offensively. He's not a good defender on the interior. He's not a good defender point blank. So I think all of those teams just have really major flaws. And L.A. just has the least out of the bunch. And they got two stars. So unfortunately, I think it's the Lakers. If there's a team that is going to go on a crazy upset run out of the play-in, it's going to be L.A. in my opinion. <laughs> Why are you saying unfortunately? Are you I don't bummed out pick by LA. the Lakers these yeah, days? Yeah, man, I, I want to come on here and go, yeah, man, Golden State's going to make a playoff push. They're going to go on some Bro crazy run again. switched up on the Lakers. Um, you went from their biggest fan to now to their, their biggest, biggest hater, hater, I guess. Man. Sad to see. I think it's L.A. too. When I look at some of the other teams, nobody can match L.A.'s two-way ceiling and nobody can match their superstar quotient in the way that they complement each other and in the way that Mm. they physically dominate in a playoff environment. Like Katie and book are on the same level in terms of talent, but it's more redundant. And uh, I know that when I get dialed in LeBron, he is going to get where he wants on the floor and bully the opposing team. And when I get dialed in AD, he can be the best defensive player on the planet and swallow up boards and dominate on the interior and kill you with his touch shot making. And there's just, such a complimentary dynamic there that has made the Lakers a scary team for years. Even when the supporting cast sucks, it's the reason that they were able to go to the Western Conference Finals last year. Obviously, certain guys stepped up in the supporting cast, but it is ultimately that LeBron AD duo and what they unlock. When I look at the Suns, I just have too many issues defensively. They are far too inconsistent. They're 21st in defensive rating over their last 15 games. And when I think about how any of these teams is going to pull off an upset. If you're looking at Phoenix, let's say they match up with the Thunder or the Clippers. Well, it's probably not going to be the Clippers now since they've been sliding. But if it's the Thunder, that is going to be a skilled team versus skilled team battle. But ultimately, I think OKC has more quality players and I think they have a much higher defensive ceiling that they can reach. So Phoenix doesn't have a clear advantage there. And we know that although they're very skilled offensively, we can't call them a better offense because of their shot diet, their reliance on the tough pull-up jumper specifically for mid-range, and the fact that there is a ceiling on that. And also there's going to be some inconsistency because you don't have those automatic routes to easy offense. Whereas if I look at how LA matches up against a team like OKC, OKC may be a better basketball team, LA is a terrifying matchup because they are way bigger and stronger in the front court. They could easily have two of the three best players in that series by a comfortable margin. I love Chet and Jada, but I mean, if AD and LeBron play up to their potential, there's a massive, Mm -hmm. massive gap there. And so the rebounding advantage, the physical advantage, that superstar quotient, I can really see LA upsetting a team like OKC in a way that is much harder for me to see with Phoenix. And then the Warriors... I really like what they've been doing. I think that offensively, they're too reliant on Steph as their lone high-end creator. And ultimately, they don't have the same size and physicality advantages that like an LA does. In Sacramento, they have their moments, but I don't think the two-way ceiling is comparable to what an LA can do. And again, I think the superstar factor is very much in LA's favor there. Okay, E. coli asks... Do you think anyone will eclipse 40 points per game in a season over the next decade or so? If so, 
Name who you think is most likely. Luca. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but do you it's... think it's going to happen? Yeah, I can see Luca doing really? it, honestly. If Kyrie, yeah. I think it would take maybe an injury to Kyrie, or it would take. I, the thing is just the volume of shots you would have to take. Yeah. And because of Luca's ability to go nuclear from behind the arc, or maybe SGA. And the only thing that's really limiting SGA, in my opinion, is the fact that he takes so many mid range jumpers. You need a guy who can get hot from behind the arc, who can just go flamethrower mode from deep. And Luca is. Luca's unaffected by ball pressure. He's really unaffected by hands in his face when he's shooting. It doesn't really make any sense. I think Jokic could do it if he wanted, but I don't think he's Never ever going to take enough shots to do it. So, I mean, my, my two guys would be would be Luca and it would be SGA. Um, no mention of Embiid, who has come the closest. I mean. Come on. That's disrespect. Is Embiid going to play enough games to qualify for the league leaderboard? I mean, um, he has recently in years until this season. I guess Embiid has a shot, but I wouldn't. I would definitely take guys who are more perimeter-oriented, more ball-dominant, guys who just get a, a ton more touches on the perimeter. I would go Luka, SGA, and then probably Embiid. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there's anybody else even on my radar. So, I don't think this is going to happen, first of all. Because I think we're reaching a point with the league where there are going to be changes made in terms of rules to favor the defense. I just think there has to be this upward trajectory and just continual leap year after year in offensive efficiency can't continue forever. That's not how the league works. Like things may generally trend upwards, but they ebb and flow. You go from the high flying 80s more freedom of movement to the very physical defensively oriented slow nineties and early two thousands. Then things open up again. And eventually there's going to be a bit of a correction because what we're seeing, dude, offensive rating league wide average in 2015, when the warriors have their first title season, right? Which you can sort of pinpoint as the beginning of the offensive evolution was 105.6. Then you fast forward to 2019. It's all the way up to 110.4. You fast forward all the way to 2024, it's 115.5. So we've seen like a 10% increase in offensive efficiency league-wide over these last nine years, which is massive. Like just to keep things in perspective, we've never seen the league offensive rating average hit 110. But I talk about the ebb and flow. It was 108 in 1984, and then it was 106, as I mentioned, in 2015. So this sort of upwards trajectory... It's never happened before, really, and I think at some point it is going to be dialed back by the rules. So if it were to continue, somebody could average 40 a game. I don't think that's going to happen. And I also think Luca is going to eventually adjust to a play style where he doesn't has where he doesn't have such an overwhelming responsibility. I just don't think it's sustainable for him to be trying to not just score 35 a night, but also have this sort of crazy playmaking load. James Harden did it for a couple years, but you don't do it forever. SGA, up to this point, just doesn't explode as a scorer. Like, he is so consistent, but he's never scored 50 in his career. I think because of the fact that he doesn't have those sort of explosions from beyond the arc. So it's a very high floor, but not necessarily the highest ceiling scoring. So I couldn't see him getting to 40. Embiid, again, came the closest. He was dropping 35 a night, but I still think 40 is just too much i mean that's absolutely absurd we haven't seen it since wilt chamberlain nobody else has ever done it in the history of the sport and i think it's going to stay that way at least for a while okay carson williams asks can you give an in-depth explanation of defense versus defensive playmaking is part one of his question logan you want to quickly take that yeah uh the, di the distinction i would make is i mean there's so much that goes into defense uh specifically Outside of playmaking, it's positioning, it's instincts, it's anticipation of where the ball is going to be. Like, you can be a good defender, but not be a great defensive playmaker. Defensive playmaking is steals. Uh, if that's right. on ball, if that's off ball, if it's blocking a shot. And you can be a great defensive playmaker and be a bad defender. Like, um, I think it's way more important to be positionally sound, to know how to guard and switch out of a pick and roll, how to help, how to rotate, where you need to be, who's hot. There's a lot that goes into defense, man, and one lapse 
equals an open shot. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a lot harder to do that. Um, the great ones make it go hand in hand, right? Like you can't call Wemby just a great defensive playmaker. He's just a great defender, period. Like he's also positionally sound and instinctual and anticipatory along with being a great playmaker. I'd say Chet Holmgren too. Like um, you can mend it, uh, but there is a, there's definitely a big difference, man. You can have one uh, without the other. Well, I think most of the time, great defensive playmakers yeah, are great Yeah, it does normally defenders. go hand in hand. Yeah. There's a strong, strong correlation, right? That probably means you have great physical tools. That probably means you have really good instincts. That probably means you have good timing. But there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. And just specifically, Logan, I think you laid out the difference in terms of terminology. Defense involves everything that doesn't show up on a stat sheet. It's your screen navigation. It's your positional instincts. There are so many different things. It's your box outs. Mm -hmm. defensive playmaking is specifically those big sp yeah. splashy plays steals and blocks i would also just say effort i mean i would say yeah yeah of course 80 to 90 percent of defense is just how hard can you go you know yeah that's what she said anyways <laughs> another question from carson williams what current nba players that aren't currently top 25 all time have the potential to end up top 25 all time uh, i can't remember if he was in my top 25 the first guy that comes to mind is Giannis. I think Giannis was in my top. He definitely was. Yeah, I think Giannis was. It would be Giannis, uh, depending on where you have him, I think. I think everybody has Giannis top 25. I think Shea Gilgis-Alexander has an opportunity to do it. Um, I think Anthony Edwards has an opportunity to do it. I think Victor Wembanyama has an opportunity to do it. Um other big stars in the league. I probably wouldn't take a guy like Jason Tatum. Um, yeah. I, I think Tatum's just too flawed as a basketball player. Uh, I think Luka has an opportunity to do it. That's – and you know what? I'm not going to count him out. Joel Embiid definitely has an opportunity to do it, dude, with his regular season success. And if he does climb the mountain, mm -hmm. for me, I've seen it too many times. I'm scarred. I have too many red flags with Embiid, just the fact that – I've seen him get injured so many times. The fact that I've seen him collapse in the playoffs, I probably wouldn't predict it. Um, and I, I don't know if I'd ever predict Embiid ever winning a title um, or, or, or climbing the hump. Again, I, I've i just seen it too many times. But he definitely has an opportunity. So I'd say SGA, Luka, Ant, Wemby, and potentially Embiid. I think that's a good list. The two guys who I expect to end up on this list who are not already there out of active guys who are already there for my list we have Giannis I guess I might as well read out exactly where I had them I have my top 25 in front of me at 20 Jokic as we already discussed at 16 oh CP3 I should have mentioned is still an active player I have him at 22 and then we have uh, Steph at number 10 I believe and LeBron at number two so those are the guys who are already there. Luke and Wemby, I think, are such all-time standout talents. Wemby, we've talked about, I think, has the clear potential to be the best defensive player ever and a dominant offensive force. Luke is on the trajectory to be one of the absolute greatest offensive players that we've ever seen. And I think both of them are so overwhelmingly great that if they don't win titles, I will be shocked. Mm -hmm. I will be very surprised. They just feel like the level of guys where, at some point, they won't be denied like we're talking about with Jokic right now. Like, there's just a special tier that you can reach. Outside of that, I think Embiid is the one who has already put together the sort of regular season resume with the MVP and with multiple top three MVP finishes. I probably wouldn't pick it right now because I think there are other players who exceed him in terms of their current peak with Jokic and Giannis and Luka. And I think there are teams that are in better situations for the foreseeable future. When you're talking about Denver, when you're talking about Boston being tiers above Philly, not just because of Jokic over mm -hmm. Embiid, but because of the supporting cast as well. And then I do worry about Embiid's health. I really do when you're talking about climbing to this stature. But he clearly has the basketball ability. Mm -hmm. If he sustains regular season Embiid over a playoff run, and Philly has a really good supporting cast around him in a couple years, if they make proper use of the assets they got back from the Harden deal, he has the potential. SGA, I love, I love. Top 25 all time is really, really tough. 
At number 25, I have Dwayne Wade, who they have some similarities just in terms of being these great downhill guards, really good playmakers too, plus defenders. And I think SGA does have that sort of individual ceiling. But D. Wade had like one of the great mm -hmm. playoff runs we've ever seen in 2006. So SGA would probably have to have a moment, a run mm -hmm. like that. Tatum, I don't know, man. He's not on that level as an individual force in my opinion right now. And then all the other young guys, as much as I may love them, book no he's never gonna have that sort of two-way dominance I, I just can't see him like imposing himself mm -hmm. over the course of a playoff run like you have to to enter these what? sort of conversations and then there's a couple guys who like aren't too far out but are further in their careers so they would have to have another like really defining moment like a Kawhi. could i give you a hypoth well, wow sure. was, was i forgot Kawhi wasn't in your top 25 was he Kawhi's not in my top 25. He's one of the first handful of guys off. I just think, unfortunately, we have seen too many years cut short. We haven't seen enough of Pete Kawhi when it matters most. I think his peak is clearly top 25, probably top 15. Let me give you a hypothetical. If Damian Lillard goes on a run this year with Giannis, averages 28 points per game, seven assists, has a, you know, a really good run, goes crazy... 25 plus, 7 plus assists per game efficiently. Does that get him close? Doesn't get him into the top 25. Maybe gets him in the top 40 something. Mm -hmm. I would have to think about the particulars, but he'd still be comfortably outside. He hasn't what done about... enough as a number one. He hasn't reached a high enough peak individually, and he would still be the second best player on this team no matter how well he plays. Do you think Zion has more room to grow? Boy, I would need to see a lot from Zion to talk about him being in top 25 sort of ceilings, starting with his health and availability consistently. But I love Zion. you got to prove to me you're a top 10 player in the league before I can start talking mm -hmm. about you as top 25 all time, or at least be like Wemby, where it's like very clear path imminently are going mm -hmm. to be there. Top 25 all time is crazy, bro. Yeah, Again, yeah. I have Dwayne Wade. Dwayne Wade. That is an insane basketball yeah, player. Yeah, man. So it's a very high bar. I think there's probably only a couple dudes in the league right now who will make that list. And I would say Luke and Wemby, but there's a couple other who have outside shots, but legitimate shots. Okay. Panthers suck again as sort of a two-parter here. Part one, why does Logan have more swag? I don't know, man. Do I? Got the white on white on today. That's pretty tough. Uh, No, go ahead, man. Answer. Why do you have more swag? You're either born with it or you're not, man. It's pretty simple. That tells you all there is right there, bro. That's tough as hell. At the end of the day, though, he's 0-6 in the trivia gauntlet. I'm 0-7. Well, I didn't want to spoil. I didn't want to spoil the next oh, game. Oh, I forgot. My bad, guys. No, it's really competitive. It comes down to the wire. I, I, might, I might eke this one out. He doesn't even know if he wins or loses. He's just focused on how swaggy he is. <laughs> okay. Part two of Panthers Suck Again's question, though, is related to another question we got. So we're going to sort of blend them together. They asked how good was Pistons Blake Griffin, mm. but Dunks and Hoops asked mm. Amare Stoudemire or Blake Griffin, peak in career. Apparently the people want to know about prime Blake Griffin. So uh, we will answer, Logan. What are your takes? Dude, Pistons Blake Griffin was so much fun, dude. He was. Ball handling, playmaking, being the lead guy. Like, it, you know, it was never going to lead to playoff success, but who yeah. cares, dude? It was awesome. <laughs> it was electric. The city needed a savior, and Blake a Griffin hero. was there, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it really all came together that year, man. The jump shooting. It was fun. It was a ton of fun. Mm -hmm. I wish that had lasted a little longer, man. Um, yeah. Peak versus career with Amari is interesting. Ah. Uh, because Blake was up there, man. People forget. I mean, I believe Blake was, was he top five MVP one year or something? I mean, he was. Blake was up there, he dude. He was fourth, yeah. Oh, it's tough because I feel like as a straight-up rim runner and pressuring threat, I'd probably lean Amari, although it's really close because Blake was a freak at his apex too. Both of them had the benefit of playing alongside all-time great point guards mm -hmm. and Chris Paul and Steve Nash. So you got guys who could feed them and put them where it needed to be. I'd probably say Amari because of the defensive impact, but I also think Blake has some playmaking impact too that is underrated where he could playmake out of the short roll, um, and he's an athletic freak too. Wow. I would probably just go Amari because I think his defensive impact went a little deeper than Blake's because Amari anchored the five spot. 
That's really close, though, man. I'd say career, I'd probably take Blake's for the longevity, but peak, I'd probably take Amari. I don't think there's enough needle-moving longevity between the two. It's funny, in terms of just, like, bottom-line accolades, they look so similar. Both Rookie of the Year, both six-time All-Star, both five-time wow. All-NBA. Mm -hmm. It is worth noting, I don't like using All-NBA as, like, a precise measure of evaluating mm -hmm. the caliber of a player because I think sometimes voters just get it wrong. But Amare is one-time first team, four-time second team, whereas Blake is, I think three times second, two times third team. So Omar's all NBAs are of a little bit of a higher caliber. And it is so impressive that he did that in one of the most stacked front court eras mm -hmm. ever, specifically in terms of bigs. I mean, every single year in the front court, you are going up against Dirk, KG, Tim Duncan. If you're listed at the five, you're going up against Shaq, Dwight Howard once he comes into his own. 2000s, lots of great bigs. Pau Gasol too, dude. Pau Gasol. I would take Amare. I think that he was just a better offensive player, first of all, at his peak. You're right. They both had the luxury of playing with these great point guards and specifically pick and roll maestros, two of the great game managers that we've ever seen. And I don't mean that in the football sense where it's sort of a dig. I just mean these are guys who both really threaten defenses with their quickness and with their scoring ability, but also had phenomenal court mapping, sense of where everybody was, all-time great pure passers. And so I think both players were elevated by that. And the one knock against Amare is you look at like 2006, he misses the whole year. But you still have Steve Nash running the show. They win 54 games. They're a top two offense in basketball. That clearly tells you who was the most valuable player in that equation, and it was Steve Nash. But I do think Amare was more skilled. If you look at his production as an isolation scorer and post-up scorer, I just think he had more game there than Blake. He was a much better mid-range shooter. Blake ends up develop developing this three-point game. But... If you're talking about interior and mid-range touch, Amare was just much more effective there. And he was so, so nimble at his peak. I mean, a great pure athlete, absolutely. And he had some power and he had vertical pop. But his body control, you look at his hop steps out of the post. Like, he was just in control. And I would say a more dynamic, skilled interior scorer than Blake and more proven in those one-on-one -on -one settings on top of what both these guys could do in pick and roll and out in transition and whatnot. And Amari was much more efficient throughout his prime. There's a lead, there's a year where he leads the league in true shooting percentage. He's consistently more than a handful of points above league average. Blake wasn't quite that efficient. And then I do think he's a better pure rim protector. Neither of these guys are bringing you a bunch of value. Defensively, it was sort of an undoing for both of them. But Amare was the better rim protector, was capable at least of holding down the five in a way that Blake never was. Blake's advantage is the playmaking. I agree with you 100%. He had that knack from when he came into the league and he harnessed it and harnessed it and got to the point in Detroit where he's not the same explosive athlete, but he's basically like a big wing. Like he is mm -hmm. ball handling. He's taking seven threes a game and making 36% of them and playmaking at high volume. That wasn't the best Blake because when he was in LA, he just had different athletic advantages, but it was really impressive that for that 2019 season, he was able to still have value when he was so clearly over the hill in terms of his athletic peak. It didn't last long, but it was really impressive while it did. But ultimately, both these guys are defined by the years where they were superimposing interior finishes, really good athletes. And I just think Amari was more efficient, more skilled and a better defensive player, so I would take him. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here in DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. And North Carolina listeners, don't forget, DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code NERDS. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook book with code nerds the crown is yours rob asks true or false scotty barnes and wemby will parallel lebron and kd but this time the kd variant wemby will be triumphant that uh, false uh, yeah <laughs> yeah I, I i love scotty barnes i'm a big scotty barnes guy uh 
I think Scotty even has more room to grow. We've seen his touch improve, his pull-up shooting improve, his three-point shooting improve. And that was the big question mark. Uh, Scotty looked like he had plateaued in his second season. Uh, it kind of hit his head a little bit on what he could be as an offensive player. And we've seen this season, that's not the case. And I do think the Raptors, if they put more shooting and more scoring and more skilled guys around Scotty, you spread that offense out even more. Uh, I think it will allow Scotty to impose his you know, physical advantages on guys a little more. He checks a lot of boxes, but I'm definitely not anticipating Scotty Barnes becoming LeBron any, anytime soon. What? Um, a few reasons. Okay. Uh, Name one. I mean, come on, dude. Like, there's just <laughs> the coordination, <laughs> the, the, the burst, the everything, man. Scotty's cool. Scotty's going to be a very good player. I, I question if he's a one or a two on a great team, but Scotty's a great player. Wemby, on the other hand, I do expect. I expect Wemby to get, like, multiple rings, multiple rings, multiple championships, multiple finals. What are you MVPs, expecting from Scotty? MVPs. Are you not expecting the same? Finals appearance, maybe, if he's lucky. I don't know what you're watching, man. The only problem I have with this question is why they think the KD variant, parentheses, Wemby, will be triumphant. Scotty Barnes supremacy all the way to the moon and back, baby. No, I don't know if this is a classic prank, <laughs> but this is an absolutely insane question. Scotty Barnes in no way parallels LeBron James. There's Have really not much a, more that needs to be said about that. Have you seen that one clip of Scotty missing that clutch free throw and just screaming? Uh, yeah. I love yeah. that clip. He's got some big personality, that guy. Also, I think that calling Wemby a KD variant, a bit misrepresentative. I've talked mm -hmm. about this before. Mm -hmm. Comparing any big guy who's skilled and can shoot to Kevin Durant. Wemby is probably going to be the greatest defensive player that we've ever seen. And he is also seven foot four, which means, yes, he has these great moments of perimeter skill, but he is most valuable when you just throw him the ball up anywhere around the <laughs> rim because he is bigger mm -hmm. and longer and more athletic than everybody else. That's not like Kevin Durant. And uh, the gap between Wemby and Scotty Barnes is about the gap between here and the sun. I mean, there's a big, big, big gap there. Okay, Noodles, with maybe my favorite question of all time. Just how good is Malik Monk right now, and what will his money look like this free agency? Uh, Malik Monk is excellent. He's a elite pick-and-roll oh, yeah, uh, scorer. He's got great burst off the dribble, great change in pace. Uh, as Carson Brebber tells it, as the prophecy foretold in his draft class, uh, he's a natural-born killer, man. He is yes, a sir. natural bucket. Mm -hmm. um, and you really cannot teach bucket-getting. Like, Malik is just one of those guys that... I mean, you saw it in the playoffs last year. You've seen it all year this year. When Malik gets hot, like, it's just he gets in that zone and there's not a whole lot you can do to stop him. I'd probably give Malik 20-plus million, 25 million maybe per year um, as a six-man or as a two-guard starting somewhere. Uh, I hope the Kings can retain him. He is, I cannot stress how imperative Malik Monk is to this team winning games alongside Fox off the bench uh, in non-Fox minutes, uh, you know, and floating the ship. The Kings need to keep Malik. Like, he is imperative to this team winning games, and he's an awesome bucket getter. I would, I think Malik's going to get a bag this offseason, and it is going to be very, very well deserved. But I, I really hope that he stays in Sacramento, man. I think there's a good spot for him. I think he's a, a really meaningful contributor on this team. And He's probably six man of the year. Uh, Malik's awesome, oh, yeah. man. Malik is Malik is awesome, and I really hope they can hold on to him. I, I mean, he's improved as a playmaker too, dude. That's what's such a good playmaker. Malik's maker. just Malik's the total package now. And if he was a little more consistent, he'd be a star. But um, he's not. But Malik's awesome. I hope that the Kings can retain him. Yeah, I think he probably is going to demand somewhere in the neighborhood of. 20 million a year and that's what i would be comfortable giving him i'm the world's biggest malik monk stan and malik monk truther bro ever since we started this show way back <laughs> when there would be a stretch every year where i would be spreading the malik monk yeah, gospel man. and it's paying off big time now man he's just a hooper he's absolutely sixth man of the year in my opinion and he does have a special combination of traits right he has good pace out of pick and roll He's a really good playmaker. I mean, he's creative, live dribble stuff, got really good feel with his bigs. He's really good at those pocket passes. He's got these creative wraparounds on the baselines. His drive and kick playmaking is good. He's a really good passer. 
and he's taken a leap over the last couple years, especially this year. But then he's also a good pull-up shooter. He's a really good catch and shooter. And he is so quick that he mm -hmm. just creates very consistent dribble penetration. And that's what we saw against the Warriors last year, dude. Like, I know his efficiency wasn't great, but he was the King's second best player. Like, he was giving problems to the Warriors because they couldn't stay in front of him. And when he blends that with this dynamic perimeter shooting, he's just an offensive weapon. Now, I don't want to sit here and say that he is some sort of all-around star because I do think there are inconsistencies in terms of what he's going to bring you defensively. The overall efficiency isn't great. It's pretty average. But when you put him in that spark plug role, he is dynamic and he presents some very problematic matchups for teams who don't have guards quick enough to deal with him and Foxy in tandem. I mean, it's just the fastest backcourt in the league. So I love Malik. I think somebody will probably give him in the neighborhood of 20 million a year this offseason. And I think that is deserved. You just don't want to go above that because ultimately he's either a great sixth man or or he's a really good second guard who maybe has to buy in a bit more consistently the, to the defensive end of the floor if he's, like, complimenting your lead guard offensively. We have another question from Noodles. Who is the swaggiest NBA white boy of all time, Logan? I think the white boy with the most juice is probably Larry Bird. Um, and not in, like, mm. conventional swag, but in, like, ball swag. Just sure. Hooper, it's probably Bird. If not Bird, I'd probably take... Um, Tyler Hero. I'd, I'd probably take Birdman. Or I'd take a uh, hero's not a bad pick either. I'd also Birdman. Bird you don't want to or... be positively associating with Birdman, Logan. I don't know, man. Birdman. No, he did some unsavory things. Um, white chocolate. After Jason his Williams. Is, white chocolate's a good pick too. I mean, he's literally nicknamed White Chocolate. Uh, white Chocolate was swaggy. Jason Williams for sure. Uh, my pick's probably Larry Legend though, man. There's very like I know he doesn't have like the conventional like swag, but he's got that unconventional white boy swag. Yeah, he's got a very white swag to him. That's for sure. He's got Hick from French Lick swag. I mean, the aura, the lore is incredible with Larry. Honestly, I would probably say Jason Williams, dude. Jason Williams just had that like park flashiness mm -hmm. and overall aesthetic as a basketball player that simply put no other white dudes have really had and i think that's why he's a legend and he's overrated as a basketball player that's what happens yeah. to most dudes who have sick highlight tapes but weren't actually that great play to play at every aspect of the game that's the jason williams story but still in terms of swag also just white chocolate is such a great nickname so he's a good choice okay unhelpful nba love this question which athlete do y'all think won way more than they deserved, but are still praised for their success, or maybe vice versa, lost more than they deserved, but still gets hate for it? I think the second one, we probably talk about more. Who's your answer to the first one? One way more than they deserved is a very, very interesting question. Um, I, and I don't know. I mean, the only guy that I think about mm. is the most consummate winner in... NBA history, and that's Bill Russell. But I'm not going to say that he didn't deserve to win that Don't much. I mean, that. he was the best defender of an era. Um, By the way, NFL was on the table here too, at least in my reading of the oh, question. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, oh, I've got one. If you want my take, it would be Tom Brady. Um, Whoa! And, let's hear it. Let's hear it. I mean, the only reason I say that is we talk we rule, all... cheating, deflate gate, spy gate, field goal merchant, Malcolm running Butler. game merchant, line merchant, well, Bill Belichick merchant. Lay it all out there. Well, I mean, we can talk about Tom Brady and all the things that had to break his way um, into becoming the GOAT, and I don't want to take anything away from him because the games were played and the results are they all, what they are. That's all that really matters. We can talk about how lucky Brady got till the cows come home. Uh, Rob Parker of Fox Sports for the longest time is not called Brady the GOAT, but the LOAT, the luckiest of all mm -hmm. time. Um, the Patriots cheated. That is not <laughs> controversial. That is true with Spygate, and what a lot of people forget about Spygate, too, is it wasn't just them recording uh, practices and getting game tape of what they were going to run, game scripts. It was the physical game script uh, repeatedly during apparently every regular season playoff game. Bill Belichick would send some assistant into the opposing team's locker room to find a play sheet of what they were going to run on the first couple of drives. So cheating... Well, I don't have to. You have Deflategate, you have Spygate, you have all of that. 
Uh, and then the luck part, the fact that Vinatieri boots home two game-winning field goals in the Super Bowl, the fact that Malcolm Butler makes an interception uh, on the goal line, the fact that the Falcons conveniently forgot how to run the freaking football. So a lot of, again, I don't want to take away from anybody that won a lot like that because the games happened, they were played, that's what happened. But when you look at all the external variables and things that happened, a lot had to go his way. And he did have the benefit of playing with a lot of great defenses, with one of the greatest coaches of all time. Uh, yeah, it's a head-ass answer, but I would probably say either Tom Brady or, if you want to do the Tom Brady thing, a guy who went by the alias to Tom Brady, Terry Bradshaw. Won four mm -hmm. Super Bowls, and I think Terry played great on the game's biggest stage, and he didn't cheat. That's something that he's got a leg up over on Tom Brady. <laughs> but Terry was never... Brady level, he was never Peyton level, he was never even Montana level. Like, you look at, you know, how efficient he was, how much he turned the ball over, how much the offense leaned on Franco Harris. Uh, Terry probably gets praised a little too much for winning four Super Bowls on the backs of one of the greatest defenses of all time. But if we're asking this question on who gets probably more credit than they deserve, it's probably Tom Brady. Wow. Logan Camden, ladies and gentlemen, with a scorching hot take which I don't totally disagree with in the sense that Tom Brady had a lot of things go his way over the course of his career. He, uh, first of all, walked into an exceptional organization just considering the fact that Bill Belichick was the coach, not in terms of the history, but in terms of who was the mastermind for well, the vast majority went to of his career. And they had already gone to a Super Bowl with Drew Bledsoe. That's true. A handful of years earlier they had. And just the fact that Belichick was the architect of so many great defenses, so consistently, so brilliant on special teams, like the phases of the game that were out of his control were very favorably set up. I also do think sometimes we can overlook what Brady did without always having like the most overwhelmingly talented offensive supporting casts in some of the 2010s years. Julian Edelman being your number one receiver for a number of years and still leading out some really great offenses is impressive. I'm just not going to really give an anti-Brady take. Logan, I know that you've been hurt. He's not my favorite, but although he has been fortunate, and that's why, even though it's like, oh my God, this unassailable winning resume, seven Super Bowls, I don't think we're locked in to say Brady is the GOAT forever because I think Patrick Mahomes is better than him right now than Brady ever was, clearly. But I still think Brady over the course of his career is the goat. And uh, I think that he's going to be top two when Mahomes passes him in terms of the greatness of the career. I was going to go with Troy Aikman for this question. I thought he was kind of the obvious answer because it's much easier to find football players here and specifically quarterbacks than it is basketball players because we have the fundamental attribution error with quarterbacks in football where we always put too much of the blame and too much of the credit on them in a way that we don't do to that extent in basketball. Just because oftentimes a quarterback is not the best player on a football team and yet they are still always going to be given that sort of front billing. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in basketball. The best player is the best player. Like there's very rarely any ambiguity about that. And also... I'm not saying this about Aikman because they won three Super Bowls, but you think about Joe Namath. A lot of people talk about the mm -hmm. legend of Joe Namath, how it doesn't necessarily perfectly match up with who he was as a football player over the course of his career. You can have a fluke Super Bowl run. You can. Yeah. You just got to win three or four games, depending on where you're starting in that playoff field. You can never have a fluke NBA title run. It's just not possible. Mm -hmm. You have to win 16 games. That means you're surviving four different series, four different matchups. Because of that fact, I just have a great deal of respect behind basically every NBA title run ever. Of course, some are easier than others, but you can't fluke into them. And whoever your best player is probably had to play pretty darn well. So there are some guys who I think are a little bit overrated maybe as number ones, but I wouldn't say they didn't deserve it outright. Troy Aikman, I just think clearly was a game manager who had one of the most talented offenses and defenses ever simultaneously. One of the best lines we've ever seen. One of the best receivers in the league. One of the best running backs of all time. And again, this dominant collective defense. Mm -hmm. And so he won three Super Bowls. But he, 
as an individual was never on the level of like the elite quarterbacks there's a reason that he makes some pro bowls but he's never even second team all pro i mean you can always play the fun game of like just comparing super average quarterbacks of the 21st century stats to troy aikman and of course passing stats are inflated now compared to what they were but everybody is surpassing troy aikman I just think he was a guy who was in a really great situation. In terms of the opposite side here, lost more than they deserved. I think about a lot of the NBA greats mm -hmm. who didn't get a ring. Charles Barkley, Chris Paul, Steve Nash. I'm not going to say it about Carl Malone. Elgin Baylor. Like, there are a lot of guys who were knocking on the door and aren't necessarily responsible for the fact that their team ultimately mm -hmm. didn't get there. They individually played at a very high level and still... They didn't have the right circumstances around them enough times. They're guys who you think, okay, if they were put in these really good situations for a decade, then they could have got it done. But it's like Charles Barkley only has a couple year window with those Suns teams. Nash has the window with the Suns teams offensively, but never mm -hmm. defensively. Uh, Chris Paul, you just think about the various playoff misfortunes, health, things going wrong around him. He's playing up to his normal superstar level. It's easy for me to find examples of that on the opposite side. Yeah, those guys are good picks. I'd say James Harden, too, and Harden's a lesser extent uh, just because some playoffs he did disappear, but right. also other times things just didn't break his way. I'd say Kevin uh -huh. Garnett sometimes can get unfairly criticized for not winning before he went to Boston. Mm. Um, on the NFL side, uh, I think the, the guy that is – probably the poster boy for the NFL, and this is Dan Marino. And totally. why I say Marino is the fact that, I mean, every year, it's like the Dolphins had the Dolphins had 15 seasons to put together a competent defense for Marino. And it's sad. In his prime, in the you know stretch after they make the first Super Bowl, the next decade, they never did it. And finally, towards the end of his career, in the late 90s, into the early 2000s, um, when the Dolphins finally put together like a top 10 kind of defense, unfortunately, Dan Marino isn't the same quarterback that he once was and just can't will his team to victory. He suffers a major um, – he was one of the first quarterbacks to come back. I think it was an Achilles injury or uh, a, a major knee injury, and Marino came back from that in 1993 um, or 94 and, you know, just slowly tailed off from there finally when they got the defense right. So I think Marino's a, a good pick. I'm trying to think of if there's any other – that's the thing with most quarterbacks is unless you're in a – a really great quarterback era, which is something that is going to happen in this era. Oh, yeah. With Patrick Mahomes, there's going to be a lot of guys that get walled off, man. If it's Joe Burrow, if it's Josh Allen. Don't say it. Don't if say it's it. Lamar oh. Jackson, I'm sorry, man. If it's C.J. Stroud, if it's Caleb Williams, you know, I don't know. Patrick Mahomes is going to be the Michael Jordan of this NFL generation where he is – stopping some of the great QBs all time, you know, um, for guys in the 2010s and 2000s, you know, thank God Drew Brees got his one because yeah. you're dealing with Peyton it's and true. Brady and Ben and all these great quarterbacks, man. Uh, Phillip Rivers, you know, I shit on Phillip Rivers a lot. Phillip Rivers and Matt Ryan are two of the greats that never got it done, that had great yeah. teams. And I think it was, you know, I, I fairly criticize Rivers, but he sure. is a, he is a great that didn't get it done. Um, there's yeah. a lot of guys to point to, but I think Marino is probably the guy that gets criticized most too because they all go, oh, he was so good. Then why didn't he get a ring? And the NFL is a team sport, man. 100%. 100%. So is basketball, but it's obviously much more so in the NFL, especially if you are any position other than quarterback. Mm -hmm. Then it almost becomes silly to like even mention championships because it's like, what the hell, man? Left tackle can eat the guy up in front of him every single time. Like... <laughs> He can't catch passes. He can't throw passes. He can't get stops yeah. on the other side of the ball. It's just very different, and that's why viewing things through the ring prism is always going to be a flawed approach, especially with the NFL. Okay, Charlie asks, thoughts on the Jets offseason and what players they should target at pick 10? We're into NFL territory now for the offseason. I, I, I've liked what the Jets have done. I, I think they're just – you're just crossing your fingers, your fingers to stay healthy. Uh, Tyron Smith uh, mm -hmm. has not played a full season in a while. You know, I like Tyron Smith. I'm glad they have. I think it's Morgan Moses on the other side. Okay. 
Uh, cool. Damn, and, bro said okay, cool. Uh, they're, they're pretty old. You know, you're bringing in Mike Williams. Mike Williams has struggled to stay healthy. Aaron Rodgers yeah. is coming off an Achilles tear. And to my knowledge, the NFL is not doing anything about these turf stadiums and these turfs. Don't be mad when MetLife claims 14 ACLs next year because it's inevitable. It's going to happen. That's what happens at MetLife. It's why the Jets and Giants can't stay freaking healthy. Newsflash, guys. Maybe we should put aside some money so the guys that we put money into and generate money for our team, maybe we should put some money into the fields that they play on so they're safe and they can be healthy and our product can be better. Just an idea. Just an idea, guys. Go maybe off, we should King. That. Let's go grow some grass, man. Let's go grow some grass. Let's go golfing. Just an idea. Uh, I like what the Jets have done, and I think they are going to be better next season. I think people who say that New York is not a playoff team – are overlooking them. I don't care how old Aaron Rodgers is. If he is healthy, this is a team that has consistently won. You know, they they won seven games this year. They won seven games last year. Yeah. This is with some of the worst quarterback play in the league. People hate on Robert Sala. I believe in Sala. I believe in this defense. And if Aaron Rodgers can just stay healthy, I think this team is a wild card team and a threat to win that division. I think the Dolphins are going to be worse next year. I am out on the Patriots as a real contender. I think it is Buffalo and New York. They're going to be fighting for the division. I'm going to take Buffalo because I think they're going to be even better next year. But I think the Jets are definitely going to be a team that is fighting for a wild card spot. And I'm not ready to count them out yet. So I like what the Jets have done. I just pray that they can stay healthy. I really like it too. I think that maybe... It was not a blessing in disguise that Aaron Rodgers missed the season with injury because obviously that sucks and you can't be like, oh, they protected him because he had a season-ending injury. But I do think having another year bought them a little bit of time to refine this roster and turn into a more complete contender. I know that I was high on what they were going to do. Logan, you thought they were going to win the whole freaking Super Bowl, so obviously you really liked their roster. But that line was going to be a concern no matter what. Mm -hmm. I think the run game, they were going to have some issues no matter what, largely because of the line. So I do like what they've done. I also worry about health with Tyron Smith and Mike Williams and whatnot. And uh, they have invested in some older guys overall. But if Aaron Rodgers is the Aaron Rodgers we know, yeah. they should absolutely be a playoff team. You mentioned the floor that they have established with these miserable offenses. <laughs> Two years ago, winning seven games, scoring 17 points per game. This year, winning seven games under 16 points per game. Bottom five offenses, and still, because of how dominant that defense is, they're able to compete. Now you put Aaron with a very legit number one in Garrett Wilson, but a legit number two now as well in Mike Williams, and I'm optimistic. I think they can be really good. How about the draft? Do you have any thoughts? Anybody who you particularly like for them at 10? At 10. A lot of people are saying Brock Bowers. Hmm, that's early for a tight end. I like Bowers a lot. I think Bowers is going to be Laporta-esque immediately. You wouldn't have taken Sam Laporta at 10 if you thought he was going to be oh, that no, good? no, I mean, if Laporta was going to, yeah, no, I would take. If Bowers produce, and they do need a tight end, so it's interesting. It's an interesting proposition. I wonder if they should invest more in the offensive line, any interior guys, um, or maybe just getting a tackle for the future, or... Another dynamic wide receiver. I don't know if that sounds crazy, but the wide receiver has a lot of talent in this year's draft. Yeah. And think about it, too. Like, the depth of the position this year, in my opinion, because you're going to have Marvin Harrison Jr. is consensus first guy off the board. Uh, you have Malik Neighbors. You have Brian Thomas. You have Mitchell. Um, Rome. Odunze. Odunze. Like, there's going to be somebody, if the Jets want to triple dip and you move Mike to your third guy, if you want to have Mike and Garrett as your outside guys and move the guy you draft as the slot guy, you know, I don't know if there's, uh, you know, I don't know if it's ever an issue getting an extra really talented um, wide receiver. Yeah. So I, 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 think I, I think I'd go wide out um, if I'm New York, man. I'm kind of talking myself into that. I can see it. My presumption, though, is that if they're going to go the pass catcher mm -hmm. mold, just considering what they did last offseason, bringing over Rodgers guys, that they already have Wilson and now bringing in Mike Williams. It's obviously not a stacked receiving core. They could improve it, but I think they might be able to add more value at tight end. And a lot of people think that they're going to go with Bowers. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. I also, by the way, 
like the Jets bringing in Tyrod just to have like an actual professional yeah, stabilizer quarterback because if they had Tyrod this past year dude maybe they win nine games like it's tough to overstate how horrible their quarterback play was Zach Wilson started most of the season and they turned to Tim Boyle and Trevor Simeon just because Zach Wilson was so bad but then both those guys were clearly worse than Zach Wilson that's a rare kind of hell in 2020 yeah all right Papa Planet asks what tier is Jordan Love in? I think Jordan Love's a tier two quarterback right now. Um, right outside, like the bona fide franchise studs. He's probably hanging in there with Trevor Lawrence. That's the tier I'd put him in. Uh, tier one for me is bona fide number one superstar QBs. That's Mahomes. That's Josh Allen. That's Joe Burrow. That's Lamar Jackson. That's Justin Herbert um, and CJ Stroud. Uh, I'm trying to think because I normally always forget one quarterback in this tier. I'm trying to I think you said them all. I think I got everybody. If I didn't say Lamar, throw Lamar in there. Um, And then I think Jordan Love is in that next tier. I think it's Love. I think it's Trevor Lawrence. Do I put Dak Prescott in this tier? Probably Dak. Put him in. Probably Jared Goff. Uh, I'd also I'd have Stafford as a tier one guy still. Um, I think Stafford's a bona fide still number one QB. Uh, He's in that tier too. And Jordan Love with another. Half a year with another year of... I think Jalen Hurts is in this tier, too. Uh, Kyler Murray is in this tier for me. If he has another year of doing what he did last season, and I fully anticipate it happening because I believe in Jordan Love, I think he could climb into tier one. But it's going to take him winning his division. I think I think Green Bay has to win their division, and I think Jordan Love has to play well for me to uh, put him in, in tier one. But I think he's a franchise guy. Oh, he's definitely a franchise guy. He was unbelievable down the stretch of last regular season, obviously. Really impressive combination of physical traits and a much more mature understanding of the game as the year went along. I mean, just processing. He got so much better. Really, really talented kid. I think he's definitely in Tier 2. There has to be a delineation between the top five and everybody else. I mean, you could argue there's a delineation between Mahomes and everybody else, but I don't know if you want to have one guy in a tier... And then Josh, Lamar, Herbert, and Burrow, of course. And uh, Stroud, I don't think is on that level right now, but I do think in terms of long-term value, he's in that tier. And then the next group of guys are tier two, so I agree. Prescott, Stafford, yeah, in terms of current ability, I would say is closer to tier one. I mean, he's a top six quarterback in the NFL right now. And uh, then you have the T-Laws and everybody. So I agree with you. Love is in that tier two. Okay, Ben asks, what are some of the NFL teams with the best futures? Well, I want to preface this with saying it's always really hard to predict NFL teams' futures. Like NBA, you get guys under contract. They're really young prospects that you like where you go, man, I like this guy's traits. He's going to develop into this. NFL is difficult for a few reasons. One, injuries. Two, turnover period. Mm-hmm. In the offseason, there's so much turnover and so many moving parts and variables. If it's coordinators, if it's player migration, if it's guys you know improving or you know falling. The NFL has so many moving parts, it's always really hard to gauge. But if you pushed me to give you specific teams, I would say I still believe in Jacksonville and Trevor Lawrence. I think once they figure it out, Jacksonville is going to be a contender. I really like Indianapolis and Shane Steichen. I think they're talented. I think they've got a great offensive line. I think they've got a great coordinator and head coach. And I think they've got a bona fide star quarterback in Anthony Richardson that I can buy into. And even if Anthony Richardson doesn't work out, I think the Colts coaching staff and requisite talent is good enough where they're going to be competitive and can find a new guy. Uh, I would say the Chargers... Uh, I really like L.A. They cleared off a lot of cap, and a lot of Chargers fans and a lot of fans across the league are scratching their head, and they're not happy that they've lost Keenan Allen, that they've lost Mike Williams, that you got to do it. You cannot have those kind of salary caps eating at you, especially at the wide receiver position. you got Herbert. you got the head coach. I don't care. They've got the two most important things figured out, coach and QB. I think the Chargers got a lot of new money figured out. they got a high draft pick. Uh, the Chargers are going to figure it out. I'm very confident in them. And I don't know if it's going to be next year, but I think they're going to figure it out down the line. Um, 
I know a lot of people don't like this team. I think Vegas is going to be sneaky good next year if they figure out their quarterback. If they're going in with Aiden O'Connell, I'm selling all my Raiders stock before the season starts. But if they get any QB uh, in the draft, or no, they got Minshew, right? But uh, Yeah. Uh, if they yeah. get another QB that I really like, I could see Vegas turning something around. And then okay. in the NFC, there's not a lot of candidates I like. The NFC, I would probably say one team. And that team, or two teams, both in the north, I'd say Minnesota is going to figure it out. They're on a decent trajectory. I like their head coach, Kevin O'Connell. I like their defensive coordinator, Brian Flores. I think they're talented, more talented on defense. I like their O-line. I like their weapons. I just don't like their quarterback. Once Minnesota, and I'm not buying into the, I know the popular thing is that Darnold's going to have his Baker Mayfield resurgence in Minnesota. I don't buy that at all. I also don't buy into the fact that Minnesota is rocking with Darnold as their day one starter. I don't buy into that at all. I think Minnesota is going to draft a quarterback, and Darnold is going to start the first half of the season, and then they're going to put a guy in. If they get the quarterback figured out, I like Minnesota. And then Chicago, you got Caleb. Uh, if Chicago can't figure out Caleb, no. uh, sorry, Chicago is just a cursed franchise that is ultimately never going to figure it out. And you guys peaked in 1985. Sorry. Wow. Wow. Uh, but I do like both of their futures. Wow. So th- those are the teams that I'd say uh, Jacksonville, Indianapolis, uh, LA, Green Bay, Chicago. Or not Green Bay, uh, Minnesota, Chicago. We got to get a leash on this guy, Logan Cam, and he's taking shots at Chi Town, Chi Rack. He's taking shots at Tom Brady. Somebody get this guy a water. Yeah, I like a lot of the choices that you laid out there. But I do like Green Bay. You mentioned a couple other teams in the North. I think when you're looking at the key ingredients to have in place. Can you really say Green Bay is like Yes, I can. If you're a scrappy young playoff team... I think that I can still say you well, have a I was right trying future. To, I was trying to stay on the on the margins. I don't know. I feel like Green Bay's kind of stamped oh. as that team, right? Oh, so impressive, Logan, that you think outside the box like that. Well, I'm going to say Green Bay because they have a lot of the most yeah. important ingredients. Franchise quarterback, brilliant young coach. Maybe they don't have like that one standout weapon, but overall they have a very young receiving mm-hmm. core that is good and ahead of schedule. A lot of good defensive pieces in place. They were already productive there this last year. They bring in Xavier McKinney in this offseason. I just love a lot of what they're doing, and it's a great franchise mm-hmm. and organization. I, and like you said, too, I mean, they were the youngest team in football last season. Youngest so. team in football, and they're already good. I mean, that bodes well. Like, <laughs> Sure does bode well. And I guess the other boring answer would be Houston, where they have a lot of the similar ingredients. Yeah. Scrappy young playoff team this year, but absolute franchise quarterback, awesome coach. And I think they're in an even better position because I see more like franchise talents on the team top to bottom. Nico Collins, I think, is a franchise receiver. Tank Dell is also really good, obviously, but super young, talented players. I think defensively, Stingley and Will Mm -hmm. Anderson are both like franchise Mm -hmm. defensive building blocks. So Houston is the team that I look at and I'm like, they have a lot of young studs, and you're right. There is always turnover in football, but when you have several core difference makers like that who are all trending upwards, I tend to be pretty optimistic. Also, Logan, I guess you can't really say the best future, but at the same time, you can because the best may be yet to come for the Buffalo Bills. And as long as they have Josh Allen, that's the reality. As long as the Ravens have Lamar Jackson – and uh, the Bengals have Joe Burrow. All mm-hmm. these teams are going to at least be in the mix. And I really like what the Ravens have done in terms of roster building these last two off seasons. I think they're loaded. And I like the Bills getting younger and uh, hopefully getting healthier with that as well. I think and the Bills had a sneaky good off season, man. I like what the Bills did. I think there was some addition by subtraction. All love to the Bills legends who had to be let go. But I think it represents a good pivot to being younger and more athletic and healthier do you guys still have vaughn under contract i don't want to talk about it you guys got to get off that there's no really great way to get off of it unfortunately if there were i think it would have already been done but anyways anyways i mean he did do a little restructuring he cut like his official salary in half i think but yeah i would love to move on from that guy All right, Logan, we have just a couple of non-NBA NFL questions this time. We like to end with them normally. This one is all for you, buddy. JD asks, what is the best WrestleMania main event of all time? 
All right, uh, if you guys aren't wrestling fans, just tune out. Uh, skip ahead. I'm gonna no, geek out or for a minute, take the opportunity to learn. The the tenant to me about a great wrestling match is the storytelling. Any wrestling storyline or any match uh, has to do with great storytelling or uh, a well crafted match. So the best matches are always going to be a, a great story that's being told combined with great in ring action. This one isn't a main event. The first match that I think of is. <laughs> Is WrestleMania 13. Uh, Steve 13. Austin enters the match against uh, Bret Hart. Steve Austin is a heel. Bret Hart is a face. And they have an absolute war that ends with Stone Cold Steve Austin, one of the most unique endings in wrestling history. He passes out in a sharpshooter due to no. the blood. He's open in his head. He doesn't tap out, though. Stone Cold never gives up. He is sitting there gritting through his teeth. He's bleeding from his forehead. It is brutal. And he passes out. And that's how Bret Hart beats him. And in wow. that moment, they switch. Bret Hart became a heel. Stone Cold mm. became a face of the company. And they did a switch. That's one of my favorites. That wasn't a WrestleMania main event. Uh, my favorite WrestleMania match ever is 26, Shawn Michaels versus Undertaker. And wrestling wow. fans will tell you that WrestleMania 25 was better. I prefer 26 because the stakes were higher and also how we got there. The stakes in the match was it was a streak versus career match. So if Shawn Michaels lost, he had to retire. So the stakes are already really high. But it was a swerve in how we got there. On the road to that WrestleMania, everybody thought Shawn Michaels was going to win the Royal Rumble. Uh, he doesn't. He gets eliminated by Batista on the way to the Royal Rumble. And so Michaels enters in the elimination chamber, screws over. He, during this time, he is begging Undertaker please fight me, please fight me, I, I just want to have this match, and Undertaker tells him, no, you got to earn it, you got to earn it, so what does Sean do, he screws the Undertaker over, he enters what? the elimination oh, chamber, over. oh, whoa, 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 <laughs> super kicks Undertaker, uh, hands over the world heavyweight title to his uh, rival Chris Jericho, uh, Jericho goes into WrestleMania with the world heavyweight title, setting up Michaels versus Undertaker part two, and the reason this is my favorite is the in-ring action is immaculate. The storytelling is great, but the match storytelling and how the match ends. WrestleMania 25 ended with Shawn Michaels doing a backflip off the top rope into a tombstone that ends the match. And WrestleMania 26 ends in a different way. Undertaker tombstones Shawn Michaels, and he kicks out at the last moment. Undertaker can't believe it. And it's like, oh my gosh, is, is Shawn going to win it? Instead of Shawn getting back up and fighting... He, and I think Shawn Michaels is the greatest in-ring performer of all time. Everybody talks about what a douchebag he was behind the scenes. I don't think there's ever been a better in-ring competitor. He is the GOAT of in-ring action to me. He gets up, and he just accepts his fate. I, I, Shawn has been fighting and clawing, and this has been his only aspiration for the past five years. Instead of fighting and clawing and trying to win this match, he accepts his fate. He taunts Undertaker. He does the Undertaker taunt to him, and then he slaps Undertaker across the face. Like, just super disrespectful. Undertaker picks him up, tombstones him one more time, pins him, and that's the match, and it ends. And it was just a, a great piece of storytelling. I'll, I'll give one more here because I geek out about this stuff. Uh, mm. WrestleMania 24, Edge versus Undertaker. Uh, World Heavyweight title versus The Streak. The ending of the, this match was awesome. Edge brutalizes Undertaker. They go for like 20, 25 minutes, and you're sitting there Brutal going... Brutal Edge. <laughs> you're Got sitting it. there thinking, uh, is Edge going to do it? Is he going to break the streak? And he's gearing up to spear Undertaker, and you're like, oh, shit. Uh, he's going to hit Undertaker. He's going to spear him. It's going to be over. Got and as Edge goes to spear Undertaker, Undertaker catches him in a submission, uh, his Hell's Gate, right as he spears him. submissive Edge. And... <laughs> <laughs> whoa <laughs> this is all on wwe this is all in wrestlemania I can yeah watch yeah wow he he traps he traps edge's arm uh in hell's gate uh it's a kimura, it's a kimura lock uh but he makes um he makes edge tap out and that's the match um so he finished edge he finished edging he finished edging man what uh those are there's a lot. I could honestly, man, I could go on and on about wrestling all day, but those are probably my top two. 26, Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, and 24, Edge and Undertaker. I, I love those matches as a kid. One time I tried to tombstone my brother in the pool, and I was gloating 
for some time putting on a show we would do these imaginary wwe matches and i didn't consider that this meant that my young brother's head was underwater mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. quite some time and so i was drowning him my father came out in quite a rage so that's my tombstone story. i remember uh my cousins came over to my house uh yeah and i didn't have any brothers uh when i was little i had two sisters and so my two uh, male cousins coming over was super exciting because all I could mm -hmm. think was, like, all the wrestling moves. Yeah. <laughs> I took my mattress off my bed, and mm -hmm. I put it in the floor, and the entire time we were jumping off of my mattress box spring onto each other doing, like, elbow drops sure, and, yeah. like, Superman splashes and stuff, and... Uh, my aunt and uncle have never been as mad at me uh, as they were when they came in. And why? So, it's good natured I, fun. I, you know, that's what we thought it was. Uh, they were not huge fans of the uh, rough housing, so uh, unfortunately, that came to an abrupt end. I mean, if they think that's bad, they should see what these guys are doing in the real thing. What that's a what I'm violent saying, thing wrestling is! My God, an RKO? Are you kidding me? None for me, thanks. All right, last question of the day comes from this guy dude i don't know <laughs> this disgruntled fan in our discord continues to harass us and i'm thinking about taking legal action i almost hesitate to give him a platform and say his name but i will if any of you guys want to contact the authorities matthew spawnauer asks what's wrong with you boys why are you so weird and freaky Oh, I think he's frustrated with the influx of messages that he's received in our Discord, considering we shout him out of every episode. Also, if you guys didn't know, you can yeah. join our Discord and talk to the Matthew Spawnauer. Uh, link is in our bio uh, everywhere on our social media platforms. I'm sure he's just flooded with messages of adoring fans. Uh, what is wrong with us, Carson? I was just going to you know, attribute it to the fact that you went to Piedmont. I grew up in rural Virginia, so you know, there's a few screws loose for me. Yeah. Uh, I have something uh, known as Groats disease, and that's mm, why I am the way I am. Please elaborate. Well, it was named after the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers second baseman back in the day, Lou Groat. He was mm. very nervous. He was very nervous and not very sure-handed at second base, and so they named sort of an anxiety syndrome after him, and that's Groats disease, and that's what I What did you say his name was? Lou Groat. Are you thinking of Lou Gehrig? No, I'm not thinking of Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig's disease, Logan, is something else, and it's much more serious. Also known so, as ALS. So do you just get like nervous, man? Yes, I have Groats disease, Logan. That's what's wrong with me. That's why I'm so weird and freaky. No, you know what, Matthew? <laughs> By the way, you're a guy who likes to be known as Matthew. You don't like to be known as Matt as much as you like mm. to be known as Matthew. Mm. But I still call you Matt sometimes anyways. Just to get under your skin. That's the kind of mind you games know, that I'm playing with you. I own you, corn boy. That's right. You think I don't notice that you're always reviewing corn? That's a weird thing to do. Freak. Dude, I heard he eats corn the long way, man. Like, like he gnaws it end to end? Yeah. I was going to demonstrate also, that, but then I realized that wasn't nah. such a good idea. He's also a sadistic SOB for liking Charlotte Hornets basketball. I wouldn't subject anyone to that. Yeah, not to mention he still lives in the glory days of Cam Newton's MVP season, which was closer to the Bush presidency than it is to today. Significantly closer, might I add. Do you ever think about that, Matthew? Do you ever think about the fact that Cincinnati hasn't produced a relevant basketball player mm. since Kenyon mm. Martin? Do you ever think about that? Ohio State, more like Ohio win a championship. Come on, man. That's all I have to say about that. All right, guys, appreciate you sending in your questions, all of you, except for Matthew Spawnauer. We do not appreciate your question, and we hope that Little Caesars reconsiders their association with you. We also hope Bladen Kirk does the same. Theo, frankly, you guys are a nice fit together, a couple of freaks, so keep on doing <laughs> your thing, I guess. As always, if you guys enjoyed the show, there is more Nerd Sesh content to be found everywhere, really, YouTube. You can find all of our full shows and the video essays, video breakdowns that we do there. We also have another trivia gauntlet coming out this weekend that we mentioned earlier. Logan and I going head to head. That's always fun. You can find all of our trivia content across social media as well. TikTok and Instagram at nerd sesh, Twitter at nerd underscore sesh. And you can listen to the podcast across audio platforms. You can check out our merch. Logan's got the hat on and we got the flags at the volume.com. And you can join our discord. <laughs> For a chance to speak to the one and only Matthew Spawnauer, that link is also at the link tree in our bio. So with that, as always, 
Appreciate you guys. I have been Carson Brabber. I have been Logan Camden. And this was Nerd Sash. Nerd <laughs> Sash.